please welcome Dirk Hondel. Thank you. I need to watch what I say in the hallway. Good morning, everyone. It's, it's always a pleasure to follow Tim O'Reilly and, and realize that nothing that you say is even remotely close to being as remarkable as what he says. So this is my third year in a row of, of being on stage for a keynote in OSCON. And my big goal for the next time around is to actually make it into the program because somehow I never end up being in the program, which may have something to do with how I end up with these keynote speeches. So Imatsusu apologizes for not being able to be here, but I'll be happy to stand in for him again. Thanks for the nice introduction. The interesting part of this is that most of my technical credits were all ancient history. Uh, mentioning X46, which has ceased to being useful, what, 10 years ago, is, is a big sign of that. Uh, but I still do a lot of things that, to me, are interesting and relevant. And, and the biggest part of this for the last eight years has been to, to help Intel understand how open source is, is so important in, in innovation, in, in creating new solutions, in creating interesting technologies, and in, in overall you know, furthering this industry. And I, I want to say over the last eight years, Intel certainly has changed quite a bit. I mean, we've gone from a company that, that was considered with skepticism by the community to one of the top contributors in, in, in Linux and open source, and someone who, who I believe really understands how open source works and how it helps us and how we can help open source and, and together create really good technology. Um, and the example of that that I want to talk about today is, is netbooks. Netbooks are our fun category started you know, less than two years ago with the EPC 701, a tiny little seven inch screen. And what is remarkable about this, this is a computer category that started with Linux. So this was maybe a first in, in something that looks like a desktop computer, a notebook computer, a netbook, a, an innovation that started out on an open source operating system brought out by the, the commercial players in this space. And if I look at this today, what is so amazing to me is that we've gone from having you know, one implementation of Linux to Windows XP, soon Windows 7, a bunch of different flavors of, I, I want to call it traditional Linux, so that the typical desktop Linux uh, um, distributions. And, and on to, why is the screen save on? Um, and on to new flavors of netbook-specific Linux. I mean, obviously, the, the Moblin project is one of those. Google just announced Chrome OS, which is a fascinating new entry in this space. So the category is hot. There is competition. And competition creates that thing that I think we all want most, which is innovation new, interesting, new technologies, new ideas, things that make using your devices, your gadgets, better, more interesting, more enjoyable, that bring them into the future, or let's just say into the now. So I want to bring some of the examples of, of things that we've worked on, because we think that the netbooks are different from computers and, and are used differently and, and need a different environment to be, to be as much fun as they can be. The first one that we've talked about very early on is being fast. What does fast mean? I mean, fast is often considered a, a, a description of a hardware uh, capability. But fast to us means that you don't make the user wait. One of those things is how long does it take to turn on your computer? How long does it take to boot your desktop machine? If your answer is more than, let's be generous, 15 seconds, then I know this is going to be frustrating because no one wants to wait for a few minutes until they can do something. We are, after all, an instant gratification society. So fast boot was one of those things that for us very early on became a must-have feature. Five seconds, two seconds. How, how fast can you be? And oh, by the way, what does it mean to have booted? When are you done? I mean, our definition of done is CPU and disk are idle, and they are ready to do something. A lot of OSs boot in, in you know, 
30 seconds, and then for the next three minutes. It's crazily trying to actually get stuff done. So what you want to do in order to be fast is, is it's, it's fairly simple. You want to do slow things as early as possible. You want to make sure you give yourself time to finish the tasks that you know that for some reason are going to take time. For example, if you want to connect to a network, the DHCP server is going to take some time before it responds to you. Or if you want to initialize hardware and the protocol for the hardware says, wait here for 100 milliseconds, then you know this process is going to take time. So you want to hide this latency as good as, as best as you can. One of the things that we've done, for example, in the kernel, we've implemented a new async infrastructure for the kernel initialization that actually has been abstracted out as an async scheduler inside the kernel. So you can basically, during boot up, say, OK, I'm ready to get all my PCI devices up, so let's just start all this stuff. And it happens in the background while you can continue with the next step in, in, in booting your system. And of course, you can bring the same logic into user space. So what are the things that you tend to wait for? What is the slowest part of this whole equation? Slowest thing is always disk. So you try to read from disk as early as humanly possible. So the kernel brings up your, your uh, I.O. subsystem, your file system, your basic user space, and at that moment, you start reading in all the data that you know you're going to use the next 10 seconds to bring up the system. So that's a smart read ahead. And we're going to have a presentation tomorrow in the afternoon. Um, I think actually I'm named as a presenter, but to, to follow the, the tradition of Intel shifting things around, Alke Koch is going to give that about how to be fast and all the things that it takes to actually hide what has not followed Moore's law in the past 20 years of PC development. So disk and the slowness of RAM compared to the slowness of uh, the, the, the speed of the CPU. So being fast, in a way, is, is a great goal, but it's also a symptom of an attitude towards the way you program your system. You need to not just say, what are the things that I'm trying to get done, and you know, write a standard sequential program and say, you know, I get this, get this, and display that, and ask for that, and then do this computation. You need to figure out, how soon can you start the things you can do? And what is the user experience going to be? So when the user clicks on a button, do I have all the things in place that I want to display as the next step? So it's an attitude. But this user experience attitude, of course, carries on not only to the, the speed of the implementation and how you implement it, but it also carries on to, to the, the graphical environment that you can present the user. And, and frankly, you know, the graphics stack in Linux hasn't changed in 15 years. I can say that because you know, I implemented the first one. I ported X386 to Linux in 92. And so not much has changed. It's very much the old Unix world designed in the late 80s. And, and one of the things that scares me the most whenever I see Linux on, on client systems that is used by, pardon, I don't mean you, normal people, not us, not developers, is how quickly you can get into this beautiful 19, late 80s motif, quasi 3D, grayish, rectangular button look. How many applications that you use every day still have these wonderful mon menus that make you go, oh my god. So, so we wanted to, to reset the way graphics are done in, in Linux. And we've done a lot of work on this over the past three years. I, I'll highlight a few of the things. Kernel mode setting, KMS, very important. Again, during the boot process, you don't want the flicker going back and forth between text and graphics and text and graphics that you used to have. So instead of having the kernel dump you into a text console and then having the X server actually do all the work of setting up the graphics, um, and doing all kinds of privileged operations, and, and potentially hosing your system through a user space application with no way for the kernel to get back to a sane state, we moved all of this into the kernel. So the kernel now controls how your graphic card is programmed, which is great because if your user applications die, if something goes wrong, the kernel always has a capability of saying, this is, this is hung, let's just reset and give the user a new 
stable working screen so at least we can you know print out error messages or, or interact or restart or do something useful so graphics becomes much more stable uh, the graphics execution manager gem a uh, memory manager in the kernel that makes sure that actually the different players in the graphics subsystem play nicely with each other. One of the things that we've learned through the computers becoming faster is that in the old way of setting up the, the cooperation between 3G and, and 2D, uh, 3D and 2D graphics in Linux was more of a, you know, the principle of hope and not in the Obama kind of hope, but more the I, I send all this data and pointers to my memory to the graphics engine and then tell the graphics engine to use it and then 2D comes up and 2D doesn't know about this and you just hope that 3D was done with the data before 2D overwrites it. And it used to work pretty well when the computers were slower but we actually figured out very tricky ways to hang your system by just having 3D and 2D working at the same time. So this no longer happens. This is all managed through a, an in-kernel memory manager. The latest thing we've done is kind of fun. Uh, we finally, and this is for the techies, allow X to run without root privileges. X, the X server is now a user, a user only. <laughs> yeah, only took us 20 years. Um, now it's a, a user application, which is a huge security benefit. You don't have this monster application running with, with uh, super user rights. But it also helps with stability of the system, again, if the X server does something stupid or a client makes it do something stupid, it now is just the user application can do far less damage. This is, this is one of the fun things. Now take this the next step. This is just infrastructure. So what does the user experience? We've done a lot of work. We acquired a company who has done a lot of work, and now it's, it's us doing a lot of work on the user experience itself. Um, Clutter is a framework that basically treats all the, the things that you do in a UI as, as actors in a 3D space that follow the rules of physics and allows you to, to create really interesting, attractive, and, and fairly intuitive user interfaces. Um, Moblin is an example that implements all this, but for example, the GNOME 3 shell is going to use these exact same technologies to create really interesting graphical uh, user experience. The third thing, so I said fast, I said graphical. The third thing that we think is important for netbooks for the whole mobile Linux environment is, is that we are connected. This is a very connected world. And so we looked at the available tools to, to manage all the, the networking environment that you have. And it, you know, 20 years of growth are kind of hard to hide in this space. It's just very, very uh, mixed bag of tools with limitations that we felt we needed to st a fresh start and figure out a way to really deal with all the different ways we connect to the network today, whether it's, you know, a quick Bluetooth connection to your phone that connects through the 3G network, your WiMAX card, your Wi-Fi network, your wired network. All these things need to seamlessly work together and be very easy to control from an attractive UI. So we did very simple things. We moved all of the logic into the core. So you no longer have to have a UI for the network manager to actually work. Conman does all this in the core. All this is easily scriptable. There are APIs to do this. It's pluggable, extensible. You can very easily create this into the, the thing that you want. But it offers a lot of services as part of the core. For example, DHCP, DNS forwarding, NTPs, time updates, all this is done in the, in the core and is, makes it easy to create a very seamless environment. Things like network connection, sharing to others, uh, um, speed, very fast answers from, from DNS because you can predict the queries that are coming and prefetch the results. So a lot of work has been done to make the whole connection management easier. But we've taken this the next step because as the devices are getting smaller, telephony is, is a big question. And telephony has been one of those areas that has been completely uh, owned in the proprietary world and has been impossible to create a truly open stack. And so together with Nokia, we've, we've just done that. We started from scratch, not taking existing software, but really have written a, a full phone stack that goes for everything from parts from you know, plain old telephony services to IP telephony, uh, implements the GSM stack, all the things that you need, is very lean, very extensible, and, and allows you to create open source phone solutions. 
So what have we done? We've looked at a new category of devices, mobile devices. We've looked at open source as the way to drive innovation because we think open source is the best way to, to, to get people together with, with great ideas, with, with great skills. And we've taken this to create an environment that is fast, that is graphical, that is connected, and most importantly, that's open source. So please join us and, and help us make Moblin the, the OS that you want and take the technologies that we've created and use them whichever way you want. Thank you.